Greetings, greetings, everyone. How are you? All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. This is Book Mecca Presents. And today we are featuring the wonderful Miss Marita Golden. And I want to definitely welcome you all. If you have any questions or comments on our live today, feel free to put them in the chat. Feel free to share and like our pages as well. And today, as I mentioned, this is an online event for authors showcasing all of their work and getting an in-depth discussion with them. So my name is Shaylin Scott. I'm the founder of Book Mecca, and we're an online bookstore and platform for Black authors, their stories, and we're a blossoming startup and platform designed to highlight these Black authors. Our focus is to bring our voices, our faces, our words to light, through awareness, events, and access to books. As a mother of two young queens myself, I strive to bring our magic to everyday life through books and ensure that our stories are continue to be told for generations. So tonight I introduce you to our special guest, Ms. Marita Golden, and I'll give you a little background on her. Her bio is intense. I definitely tell you that. She is one of my favorite authors and she's the co-founder and president emeritus of the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation. Ms. Marita Golden is a veteran teacher of writing, an acclaimed award-winning author of 17 works of fiction and nonfiction and anthologies. As a teacher of writing, she served as a member of the faculties of the MFA Graduate Creative Writing Programs at George Mason University and Virginia Commonwealth University and the MA Creative Writing Program at John Hopkins University. Some of the books and novels that she's written is The Wide Circumference of Love, one of the ones we'll be talking about today, After and the Edge of Heaven and the Memoirs, Migrations of the Heart, Saving Our Sons, and Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through the Color Complex. Her most recent book is the anthology which she edited, Us Against Alzheimer's, Stories of Family, Love, and Faith. And she's the recipient of many awards, including the Writers for Writers Awards, presented by Barnes and Nobles, Poets and Writers and Fiction Award for her novels, and she's also been awarded by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. So thank you again for joining us, Ms. Golden. It is my honor to have you here. And everyone here is on a live definitely is giving you a round of applause. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, so let's dive right into our conversation here. Before we do, I wanna make sure that everyone on our live is good to go and has any questions at all, let us know. Okay. All right, everybody's good. So let's get started here. So you have a very impressive career and you've inspired so many and shaped so many writers today. Have you always had a desire to write or did you have a different vision for your career coming up? Well, I think I sort of came out of the womb as a writer. I had all of the um, personal characteristics that make a writer. That is, as a kid, I was insatiably curious. I loved to read. And I was always writing something. I was always writing a poem or a story. And then I had the good fortune to be raised by parents who uh, conspired, I think, to make me a writer, even though they were not really aware of that. My mother mm -hmm. Uh, gave me an enormous amount of self-confidence about writing. In fact, when I was 12 years old, she told me I was going to write a book one day. And my father would tell me stories at bedtime um, about famous people from the African and the Black past. So that as a young kid, I grew up hearing stories. And I learned what a good story was. So that my father was my first writing teacher. I love that. I love how it's ingrained in you and it came from such a young age. Uh, you don't see that a lot. There are a lot of families I know who I'm looking at your library in the background. You don't have a library like that or who have always wanted to have a library like that. So I love that they encourage you early on. Uh, so let me ask you a question about growing up too. So when you're writing your stories 
and you've written so many great ones. Who did you look to as your mentors or your motivations behind your writing? Well, I think initially, I don't know that I had mentors. I just had a lot of questions um, about the world. And what I learned from my parents was that it was okay for me to ask questions and that I should expect that those questions would be answered by somebody. And that if I was the only person who answered those questions by writing something, then that was okay. So that I didn't have any mentors per se until I was probably in college. But by then I'd been writing for quite a long time. My, my natural curiosity and my desire to, um, to be part of a larger conversation and to be creative, to create something in the world was what drove me for a long time. And it wasn't until I was in college in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, which was a great time to be a young black woman in college because the whole world was opening up in terms of opportunity for black people. And you had the first wave of um, the second black renaissance of writing so that Maya Angelou, you know, Alice Walker, Toni Morrison were beginning their careers. So they then became my mentors. Did you ever get a chance to meet any of them? Oh yeah, I've met most of them. Really? I mean, um, when I was in graduate school in New York in the early 70s, I was studying at the journalism school at Columbia. And it was just a marvelous time to be in New York, um, to be young, gifted, and Black. Oh, yes. as, the, as, as so many opportunities that our parents had not had were suddenly open and available for us. And there was a huge and very dynamic writing, black writing community in the city. And I would go around to these bookstores and I would hear poets like June Jordan and Audre Lorde, because oh, I was writing poetry then. Oh, I'm and I wasn't writing anything else. I was just writing poetry. And um, my favorite story I love to tell about mentorship is that um, I went to a poetry reading one night and the, the great poet, you know, Audre Lorde, who was um, even then beginning to really make a huge difference um, in the world of writing and Black women's writing and feminism. And I went up to her at the end of her reading and, you know, thrust some of my poems at her and asked her if she would please, if she wouldn't mind, would she read them and give me her comments. That so, is courage. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a week later, I was laying on my bed in my apartment and the phone rang, you know, this is before the internet, the phone rang and it was Audre Lorde. And she called me and she took a deep breath and she said, that I was a wonderful writer, that I had a lot of talent, and she hoped that I continued to write. And it meant so much to me to be mentored. Um, June Jordan was very um, encouraging, and, and, a, and, and a lot of people encouraged me. And so I was mentored very generously. And so I learned from that to do the same thing. So mentoring uh, writers is kind of in my DNA, um, I I love it. It gives me it gives me back something. But um, so I've met. I mean, I've I've interviewed Toni Morrison, had lunch with her. I know Nikki Giovanni. I mean, because in some to some extent, you know, even though they were older than me, I was sort of right behind them, and they yeah. were both mentors and and colleagues. And through my work with the Hurston Wright Foundation. Um, I've gotten to meet everybody from um, Richard Wright's daughter to Zora Neale Hurston's great niece. So it's been a very rich uh, life that my writing has given me. I bet now, if that is not the most encouraging thing that will motivate you to write, it's having someone like Audre Lorde say, yes, continue writing and having such influence from such great writers 
loving what you're doing. Oh, I love every. Now tell me a little bit about your work with the foundation. What's your role? Well, I'm now no longer actively involved, but I'll tell you a little about the founding. It was 1990. And this was a period when I had just, I had done my, um, I'd done Migrations of the Heart. I'd written um, my three books and Terry McMillan was, you know, all over. And so there was a very vibrant black literary scene. At the same time, there were all these MFA programs, programs, graduate programs in universities around the country where you could get a degree. You could say, oh, I want to be a novelist. I want to be a poet. So I'm going to study for two years and get a degree. And I was on the faculty of one of those programs and I didn't see many black students in the program. So I wanted to do something to encourage enrollment in those programs and also just encourage young black writers. So um, I, with the help of um, Clyde McIlvain, we started a foundation, the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation. And we started out very small. I took $750 of my own money and we gave out an award to um, the best black writer who, who, who was a college student in the DC metropolitan area who written a story. <laughs> And well, 30 years later, the, pro, the foundation is now, um, has a summer writers workshop, um, weekend spring workshops. We have the annual um, Hurston Wright Legacy Award. And we have been instrumental in, in mentoring and giving real encouragement to young black writers at a crucial point in their career. Um, Tar Yari Jones, was recognized um, with a college award wow. from the Hurston Wright Foundation. Um, the current number one uh, bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list is written by um, a young woman who won the college award when she was in graduate school, Britt Bennett. So it's been very, very satisfying to because a lot of times these, these writers are on the campuses of schools where they're not getting a lot of support. Mm -hmm. um, even in their writing classes, they're writing stories that if they're in a classroom full of white people, they may not understand the stories. They may not get the support. So to get it from the foundation means a lot. And I have to put in a plug here. I have to say that anybody, anybody who's listening who who's a fan of black writing, who wants to know about black writing, um, you should go to the website for the Hurston Wright Foundation. Um, in October, we will be having our, well, well, this is our 30th anniversary year. And I think I, we deserve a round of applause. 30 years, yes, 30 years, years to be around. And another, and also that I was able to step aside, Clyde and I were able to step aside and a new generation of leadership take over and they're doing a great job. So in October, we generally have H October, the Hurston Wright Legacy Awards. And I can't tell you, imagine the Oscars for black literature. Oh. Imagine a room full of beautiful black people, all who are published writers. Imagine a room where these writers have come from Canada, from Africa, to sit in that room and be recognized. That's the Hurston Wright Legacy Award every year. I it's just extraordinary. That. And so this year, because of the pandemic, of course, it will be virtual, but um, we recognize the best writers in fiction, nonfiction, poetry, as well as college writers. So working with the foundation meant an enormous amount to me. Um, it, it, it gave me a sense of community and it allowed me to create community for other black writers. That is beautiful. I definitely want to plug that for sure. Everyone who's listening, go to the website, follow them. Their content is amazing. You see some of the writers who have won. I think I have the majority of the books that they've written now. <laughs> So the writers, do they come back and do they give back to the foundation? Oh yeah, they come back and they teach writing workshops. Huh. They do readings for us. Um, 
they contribute, they support us in a variety of ways. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of teaching, you're a teacher as well. So what do you teach um, in the colleges or what is your specialty? Well, my teaching in the college realm is, is I don't do that anymore. Previously, I was teaching at uh, Virginia Commonwealth and George Mason and other colleges. Right now, I am, for the past several years, I've been doing my own workshops and having an, a great deal of fun. Um, the great thing about doing my own workshops is I can, I can talk about writing in a way that I want to talk about it. I can talk about the spiritual nature of writing. Um, many, and, and also, I can be open to people who might not find themselves in a university setting. Um, a lot of times in my workshops, I'll be working with people who um, are in their 50s, in their 60s, who for years have wanted to write and finally have given themselves permission to write. Mm -hmm. And these are often extremely talented people. Um, they've been holding these stories inside. And so what I do in my workshops is I, I, I say that I don't teach them as much as I create an environment where they can release the writer inside of them. Mm -hmm. So in my workshops, there's everybody there. Um, you know, someone who's 30, someone who's 60, someone who's writing a novel, someone writing, writing a memoir. And um, since the pandemic, I've been doing online <clears throat> virtual which I found to my surprise is, is a lot of fun. I was one of the last people I have to admit to go online. Um, really? I kept thinking, oh, oh it, won't no. be, it won't be as intimate. But then in 2019, no, in 2018, I finally said, I'm gonna do this. And it was so much fun. You know, I, I, re I really like teaching in my pajamas. No. Oh, hey, that's the best part. No one should see from the neck down. <laughs> right. Going right. right. I love it. Now, why do you think there are so many, right? There are, especially now, there are a lot of people who are getting into writing now and trying to use it as a space. But what, what do you think it is that's holding people back from writing their stories? You spoke about the one lady who took years before she even decided to really write. Well, I don't, I don't, but I don't think today people are being held back from writing. I think that, I mean, this, the, it's just amazing how many people are writing. And that's, that's for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of it is, some of it's political and sociological. One of the things that the civil rights movement, the women's movement did was it broke down the idea that white guys were the only people who had something to say. Yes. And then you had black women writers becoming enormously popular, whether they were writing serious literary work or whether they were writing popular fiction. And then you had um, the ability to simply self-publish quite mm -hmm. easily, which, which years ago was really a big deal. Um, it was hard to do, it wasn't reliable. But in the last 30 years, people can have a manuscript and for a couple of thousand dollars, get a reputable company to produce a really good looking book. And so it's mm -hmm. relatively easy now to get published. And a lot of times, many people will want to publish a book not so they can be on the New York Times bestseller list, but because they want to capture the meaning of their life. Older people want to um, give the story of their life to their grandchildren or even to their own children. So you have now in, in, in this country anyway, people feel that they have the inalienable right to write and you better not try to stop them. <laughs> there you go. You are definitely speaking to me. I you know, there are, are so many families, especially in the uh, African-American community, that don't speak about our history or it gets lost. It gets buried with uh, our grandparents pass away and all those that are holding on to those stories. So the thought of us writing down our history, even just for ourselves, I love that. Um, 
that's part of the reason why I started Book Mecca as well, not just my children, but I feel like everyone's voice needs to be heard. Even if you're just reading it yourself, mm -hmm. writing is cathartic. Writing is a therapy in itself. <laughs> and yeah. whether or not you get it out, someone mm -hmm. can relate. Yeah. And, and for a lot of reasons, parents may not tell their children what they've been through or what they experienced as a child or the hardships they overcame for, for a lot of reasons they might tell them, but they will write it. And when you, when you read, just for example, give you for example, I was working with a woman, I, I do manuscript evaluation. So if you have a manuscript, you know, I will read it, give you an assessment. And so two, two examples, one woman, um, she's in her 80s and she was writing about her how her family had migrated from the south to new jersey mm -hmm. and she wrote about how when they were getting ready to leave the cousins in the family would leave the shack where they were sharecroppers and for for, for several weeks they would dry run the escape so they would go to the place where the train because they were going to jump on a train headed north. So they would say, okay, boom, uh, we know that it's such when the moon is such, such in the sky, the train is headed here. Yeah. So one night, the two cousins went out and it, 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 it was going to be a dry run. Mm -hmm. But one cousin jumped on the train and left the other. Oh my <laughs> so he jumped on the train and headed to Chicago. And so I said to myself, oh my God, people had to practice escaping. People had to practice escaping from the horrors of the segregation. And then another woman was writing a book about growing up in a really racist part of a small town in Florida. Mm -hmm. And there were 10 siblings and in this town, it was, this was a town where her father was walking home one night and he passed a group of white men just standing in a group on, this, on the side of the road. Mm -hmm. He was so terrified because he was afraid that those white men might get it into their mind to just lynch him, kill him, beat him for fun, mm. for their own amusement, that he, he hightailed it out of there. And she told the story of how out of 10 siblings, only two finished high school. Because in that town, there was no high school for, for the black kids to go to. They had to, at the eighth grade, drop out of school and start working. Now think about what that means for the black community. How that cripples the accumulation of wealth. Mm -hmm. How that cripples the accumulation of expertise and knowledge so that out of her 10 siblings eight of them will never wow. go above a certain level so when you read stories like that you know written by your grandmother you, you say oh my god this is what it has meant so these stories are very important very 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 precious um to to, to have in the world I want to read those stories. I want to read them too. <laughs> They're like, what book is that? I want. <laughs> I, which brings me to another thought too, with especially the memoirs and the, the uh, nonfiction stories that are written. I love reading those, but the fiction novels that are out there, sometimes I get lost in the characters and I don't want to leave the characters. Right, away. exactly. That's a good sign. They seem so real, which brings me to your book that I read, The Wide Circumference of Love. When I found this book, it was, I'm big on Instagram. So with all you bookstagrammers out there, this was floating around. <laughs> I mean, on everyone's page for months, just read the book, read the book. I got the book and I read it twice. That's how much I loved it. And I'll give you just a little, this is just my own fan out moment. So bear with me here, but I fell in love with it because this story takes uh, 
a really tough and emotional issue, Alzheimer's. And it brings in love and a, a true to life detailed story with a family unit that you can relate to. I mean, everything. And just for you readers or you viewers who are out there, I'll give you a little background too. So little stats, Alzheimer's Association said that it's an emergency public health crisis mm -hmm. among African-Americans, mm -hmm. yeah. a silent epidemic. They found that blacks are twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's among other races and is the fourth leading cause of death among older African-Americans. So this is not just your grandmother's disease. This is not just something mm -hmm. that happens to a small percentage of our population. This is a huge issue that's going on. And so the way that you touched on just one family's story and how they dealt with it. So the first thing I saw was your first chapter starts with my birthday. So I was like, hey, good night. <laughs> The second one is, I swear it was written for me. You have both of my grandmother's names in here. Eunice Benjamin is my grandmother's name on my dad's side. Uh -huh. Nadine is my grandmother's name on my mom's uh -huh. side. Alzheimer's runs rampant in our family. Oh. And oh. Sean's struggle with dyslexia as a youth is what my kids have dealt with. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so it was from the beginning of the story to the end. What is your inspiration when it comes to character development? Are you pulling from others? Are you pulling a, a little bit of the characters you? Where does that come from? Because they're so detailed. Well, first I wanna say that um, I'm very pleased to tell everybody that the book has been optioned for um, a, a TV series. Um, yes. Aaliyah Williams, wait. whose um, production company is Just a Rebel, optioned it, uh, and she's working on a, on a script now so that hopefully um, sometime in the future, in the near future rather than the future future, it will be um, streaming um, near you. Um, but the inspiration for the book um, doesn't have really anything to do with my life. I was working on another novel and I had written, it was set in Washington, and I had written about 100 pages, and I really felt like it was going nowhere. I felt like I was writing from my brain and not my heart. Mm -hmm. So I stopped writing, and I just gave it over to higher power. I said, oh God, you know, I'm giving it over to you. Whatever you want to do with me, take me, please take me. <laughs> and, and about two or three weeks later, uh, I woke up and the, some of the characters in those hundred pages were now in my mind in a story that dealt with Alzheimer's. And I've written about very tough subjects in the past. I mean, I, my novel After is about a black police officer who um, shoots a young man during a police stop because he thinks he has a gun and it turns out to be a cell phone. Um, I've written about a mother who's responsible for the death of her own child. So I I don't have a problem writing tough stories, but I was a little surprised about this. Um, so when I found these characters had drifted or migrated into a new story, I said, okay. And then I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's. So I had to start researching. I had to, you know, I got on the computer and started Googling Alzheimer's. I found a social worker not far from where I live who works with families who have people in their family who have dementia or Alzheimer's, and she helps them navigate the system to get the kind of care that they need. So she was my guide as I was exploring this unknown world. And she connected me with families, and also a memory care unit, a facility where people with Alzheimer's and dementia lived. And they were so pleased that I was writing the book. And they said, whatever we can do, any questions you want to ask, you have complete carte blanche. We will help you in any way. So I spent time in the memory care unit just watching people 
I um, interviewed uh, the wife of a gentleman who lived there. I read a lot, but in the final analysis, um, these characters were fictional and they came from my imagination. Mm -hmm. And yes, pretty much every heroine that I write about is a little bit of me. Just as most painters will tell you that when they paint, every character in their painting looks a little bit like them. So pretty much the main <laughs> female characters have some of my characteristics. Um, but um, I knew that I wanted the family to be a, a middle class or upper middle class family so that they weren't struggling with money mm -hmm. so that we could deal with other issues. So the issue is, the, the premise is, can a marriage, that a marriage can survive, love can survive and grow even in the midst of something as challenging as Alzheimer's disease. And it challenges and changes the, the nature of the love between the husband and wife and the grown children and the father. And um, then I, after I had done the novel, I thought, okay, I'm through with that. But then I said, well, no, I'm not through with it because, really bad. <laughs> because I had discovered during my research that African-Americans were twice as likely to develop it. And that was a statistic that at that time, six, about six or seven years ago, was not as widely known. I mean, people in the memory care unit who were in charge of things didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Doctors that I would talk to did not know that. So I subsequently wrote a major piece of journalism for the Washington Post Sunday Magazine, all about Blacks and Alzheimer's. And I was very pleased that it had enormous impact. A lot of people said, thank you. And it really was the first piece of its kind. So then I said, well, I'm through with Alzheimer's. But then I wasn't because I kept being haunted by the fact that while I was doing this research about a very serious and kind of de 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 depressing subject, I kept hearing stories from family members of how they had um, survived it and how um, they had learned to love their family member with a renewed love, that they had been positively transformed and changed by having to care for somebody, by having to love someone through Alzheimer's. So I thought that was a great story. So then um, as an effort to support the work of the organization Us Against Alzheimer's, which does a lot of work to support African-Americans and women and Latinx people around this issue, um, I put together an anthology where a lot of wonderful writers donated their stories. And so all the money from the sale of the book goes to support Alzheimer's research. I so now it. I think I am through with Alzheimer's. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> There's a lot to be done. <laughs> I, I think, sure. but, but you asked where the character <laughs> came from, and like for example, the character of Sean, the young, the, the son. Yeah. He's inspired by my son. Mm. Um, some of the issues that he has with his parents are some of the issues my son had with had with me. Um, he's dyslexic because it's important when you're creating a character that the characters have to have a wound. Um, char readers don't bond with characters around how strong and beautiful they are. They bond with them over how vulnerable they are, how unsure or uncertain they are. That's how we connect. And so um, I was at a party one night and I had begun thinking about dyslexia and what it would mean for him to be in a family where everybody was a super achiever, but he had dyslexia and was really, really challenged by it. So I met a woman at the party who had dyslexia and she, we talked for an hour and she talked about how dyslexia for men, it's often worse yeah. than for females and many of the challenges um, that people with dyslexia have. So I left that party knowing that he was going to be dyslexic. So when you're living in the world of this story that you're creating, 
um, there are no coincidences. Everything sort of falls in place. You meet all the people you need to meet. So um, I worked on that book for about, I'd say about three years. Yeah, about wow. three years. It almost seems like if you walk out the door, you could come up with a story just with things around you from the people you meet. I know it's not that simple, but it you, you take from things that normally, a normal conversation, I probably am walking and talking to the lady about dyslexia. I'm not thinking I'm going to put it in my story or I'm going to put I it mean, in my theory. I, I have friends who will be in conversation with me and say, look, I don't want to read about this, Marita. Don't put <laughs> I know, I have to say off the record. Don't put me in your story. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Well, we will definitely put your book on our page so people can go and buy your book so those proceeds can go to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you for that. I do wanna, if I can mention just a few segments in the book here that you had wrote about. The family, as I mentioned, seems so relatable and so detailed. You touch not just on Alzheimer's, but there's a portion about women's strength. There's a, a section on colorism. There is a portion on, you know, the relationship that the man and the woman had. The traditional relationships are a little different in the book. I mean, you well, yeah. I mean, you're talking about the fact that after Gregory, because the novel opens on the day that Diane takes her husband, who's been a very successful architect in Washington. Uh, to live in this memory care unit because he has, he's about 69, he has um, early onset Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And um, in the memory care unit, he meets another woman. And because he no longer remembers that he has a wife, he falls in love with this other woman. And that sets off a chain reaction um, that forces Diane to consider her life, you know, what does that mean for her? Um, so yes, yes. And I thought that was a, I mean, and it's so interesting because uh, when, I'm writing, when I'm writing my books, I will usually have one or two readers. That is mm -hmm. um, people who either know something about the subject or, or and or represent my typical reader. Like when I was doing the book about um, the police officer, yeah, I interviewed over a dozen cops, but I had one particular cop read several drafts of the book. So he kept me honest and he kept me accurate. And I had the same thing with, with this book um, to make sure that I was accurate because the book was going to be read by people, not just people like you, but people who were scientists and people who really knew. So I really had to get it right. And um, so I'm, I'm very humble about the experience of creating these stories. But, but once you get into the lives of these characters, they really do become real for you. Yes. Um, I mean, they become so real that they will take over a story. Mm -hmm. For example, when I was writing After, that originally was going to be a story that focused mostly on the family of the young man who had been killed by the cop. But every time I would give the pages that I'd written to my readers, they would say, the cop was the most interesting character. Now, mm -hmm. I didn't want to give, I didn't want to make him the main character because my son had been the victim of excessive force at the hands of a cop. I didn't like cops. And I'm going to make a cop the hero of my book? No, 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 no. <laughs> but then one day, the, he simply took over the book. He simply, it was a point at which I simply could not write the book any other way than to really dive into his story and um, see him. I had to see him not as a cop, but I had to see him as a man mm -hmm. without his uniform on. Talk about living through your characters and just being so entrenched. I know when I read certain books, I have to wait between our, before I read another book because I'm still thinking on the characters and their story and wondering what happened to them and where they are going next. Some of the books I read, I wish they had like part two, part three. <laughs> so I am happy that this will be a movie or a, a, 
a show. I'm looking forward to that. Well, you see what happens, I'm working on a new book, um, but, but for that book, uh, one of the things I'm writing about is healing stories, how mm-hmm. stories heal us. And so I was looking up one day, I said, what happens to the brain when you're reading a story? Well, what happens is that when you're reading a story and you, your brain is reading about a character who is in crisis, the brain releases um, a hormone that activates in your brain the desire to be connected to that character. So the brain says, oop, oop, releases a hormone that literally addicts you to, <laughs> to that character. So really? you are, you are, exactly. <laughs> so there's a, it's cortisone and there's all this stuff happening. You think it's just happening in your heart. It's really happening in your brain. Your brain is addicting you to the story until it is finished. All these addictive <laughs> That's a good addiction to have. Yes. This is probably why we have too many to be red piles everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> we have a lot. <laughs> and, is- and if you think about it, we, we are addicted to stories. All Facebook is is a story. Mm-hmm. Twitter is a story. Soap operas are a story. Gossip is a story. So everything in life is a story. An argument is a story. So, um, yeah. Which that makes me think of a quote that I found that you did. Um, you said a novelist <laughs> has to love humanity to write anything worthwhile and poets have to love themselves. I love that. I was sitting here thinking like, am I a poet? Am I a writer? Which one am I or which one could I be? There are so many people now that are, are writing in kind of that in-between space between poetry and becoming a novel and memoirs. Why do you think it's so important, especially now, for writers to kind of join the ranks? Well, I think that the fact that we have so many people writing now means that we're living in a world where people really feel that they have a right to be fully realized. I mean, we're living in a world, as, as, as bad as, as, as depressed as we may be at this particular moment about the world we live in, we are actually living in a world that, in, that has reached the height of progress in human history. That is, animals have rights. Even though at this moment, there are probably in the world as many people enslaved as there were 150 years ago, sexual slavery and other forms of slavery. We don't accept slavery as a good thing. Mm -hmm. We know that slavery is wrong. In human history, for most of human history, slavery was accepted as okay. So that um, people, human beings, wherever they are now simply have an enlarged sense of who they are and their rights in the world. Mm -hmm. And one of those rights is the right to have a story that is worth sharing with other people. Whether you are um, an immigrant or a CEO, your story is worth being, being told and being heard. I love it. So speaking of stories, what are you reading right now? Are there any authors that are- Well, I'm currently reading, I'm reading, in fact, I was reading just before we, we joined, I joined this stream, um, Memorial Drive, mm. which is um, a memoir by Natasha Trethaway. And she is, um, she was the, the poet, the, the, the US Poet Laureate for a couple of years down here at the uh, Library of Congress. Um, and she won the Pulitzer Prize. She's an extraordinary, she's an extraordinary writer. And um, her, her mother was murdered by her stepfather. And for much of her adult life, of course, you know, much of her life, you know, she's been haunted by that. And um, she's finally written about the meaning of that and how it impacted her life. It's a slim book. It's only about 200 pages, um, but it's beautifully written. It's, it's hypnotic. 
And um, I, as soon as we get off this call, I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> That's how addictive it is. One of those addictive <laughs> books again. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I'm adding it to my pile of books that I have to read. <laughs> but I'm, I'm currently working on a new book, um, a collection of essays, interviews, meditations, called uh right now is called and i think this probably will remain the title um black does crack strong black women how we hurt how we heal mm. and it's about it's my personal i'm not writing as a therapist i'm not writing as a psychologist it's not a self-help book it's my meditation on the strong black woman complex how mm -hmm. it provides us with enormous resilience, but also how we pay a heavy price for it. Um, and in the book, I, I talk, I, I make a space for Black women to tell stories of how they have been hurt and how they've healed. So you hear these women tell these stories of, of going through trauma, going through difficulty and healing, sometimes with the support of therapy, sometimes not. We have a big problem in our community, um, black women in self-care. You know, we don't, you know, we'll stand in line for, for six hours to vote for Barack Obama, but we won't make an appointment with the doctor to get our blood pressure checked. You know, we will um, march to the school to berate the teacher if, if we feel our kid has been mistreated, but we won't go into our boss's office and ask for a raise. And there's the health issues. Black women are four out of five black women are obese and obesity related diseases like heart attack and stroke. We're dying of them more than anybody else. So I start with my own health journey, which is basically a good one, but I kind of had a little scare last year and then write about my strong black woman complex and I, I talked to some therapists, talked to some Black women, and I write about um, anger <laughs> and how we need to own our anger, that our anger is not a bad thing. So um, that'll be out next year. Oh, I can't wait. Well, as soon as it comes out, please let me know. <laughs> Oh, I will. I definitely want to know. Oh, I okay. I have so many questions, but so little time. I, my mind is just going everywhere here. Um, one thing I, I did want to ask you is, I saw this on, I'm not sure if it was a bio or if it was a write-up on you, that you are a literary activist. What do you mean by a literary activist? What does that mean? Well, the, 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 by, the, by creating the Hurston Wright Foundation, that was an expression of literary activism. So that I have spent a lot of my career, not just writing, but engaged in institution building, mm -hmm. um, engaged in activities that would create a broader range of, of opportunities for black writers. So that's what being a literary activist um, has meant for me. That's definitely goals for sure. That's goals for me, <laughs> if I can be any type. You've done so much and my hat goes off to you for sure. And I know everybody who's on our live and who'll be following, we'll make sure to share all the video with everyone here, but um, what would you like your legacy to be? Is it just your writing? Is it the foundation or would you, what do you want to be remembered for? Um, a if, <laughs> if there was any epitaph, um, it, I would like to say, she gave herself away. Hmm. Meaning that I tried to give myself away to people through my stories and through creating community wherever I was. So that I would like to be remembered for my writing. I'd like to be remembered for um, the work with the foundation. I'd like to be remembered as someone who was compassionate and caring. And I'd probably like that to be the first thing that I was remembered for. I hope so. 
Well, that is beautiful. I definitely, I know we don't have a lot of time and we'll end here, but I do want to make sure that everyone who's on our live and who's viewing knows how to get in contact with you, how to find out where your books are. If you're not buying a book on Bookmecca, which you can, bookmecca.org, you can follow us on our Instagram page as well as our Facebook page as well, a follow-up. But you can also go to maritagolden.com and that will be listed to make sure that you can purchase all of her works. I even got your anthology, Gumbo, which I love. Okay. That one has okay. All kinds yeah. of goodies. In there. On my website, um, there's a link to Amazon to purchase any of my books in the bookstore. Um, and if you go to the website and you sign up, um, I'll get your email. So you'll be added to my listserv. Great, great. Well, thank you again so well, much. Thank you. This was so much fun. I love it. And please, if you come up with, have your new book and your oh, book. Oh, yeah. Book, oh, yeah. You're on my list. Add me to the list, please. <laughs> <laughs> You're on my list. Okay. Best of luck to you. And thank you again for your graciousness and coming on. So okay. thank you guys. Have a great night. Give your daughters a hug. I definitely will. They're up waiting for me now. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye-bye.